The Second World War is undoubtedly the most devastating conflict in the history of mankind, claiming the lives of over 75 million people, of which 40 million are civilians. Many of these innocent individuals perished to the intentional genocide, brutal massacres, extensive bombings, diseases, and starvation. Perhaps the most devastating of these tragic events is the MV Gustloff ship disaster. With death toll exceeding that of Titanic and Louisiana combined, this is the story of the biggest maritime disaster in history. But before we begin, be sure to subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up. Your support allows us to share these important historical accounts. It all began in January 1945. It was clear the advantage in World War II was with the Allies. The inevitable collapse of the Third Reich cast a shadow over Berlin, destined to succumb within months. Among the German populace, the dread of vengeful Soviet forces committing acts of rape and murder fueled a collective urgency to escape impending punishment. Faced with land routes blocked by Allied forces, the only route back to Germany was through the perilous sea. In East Prussia, soon to be divided between the Soviet Union and Poland, Operation Hannibal unfolded a colossal evacuation initiative to transport civilians, soldiers, and equipment to safety through the Baltic Sea. The port city of Gottenhafen witnessed a surge of German civilians converging on the docks, seeking refugee aboard the former luxury ocean liner Wilhelm Goslov. Despite overwhelming the city, there was no turning them back. For those who could reach the dock and secure a place on board, the Gustlov promised a journey away from the besieged East Prussia. However, the perilous reality was that the Soviet Navy awaited any transports attempting to cross their path. Tragically, the Gustlov fell victim to this grim fate succumbing to what stands as arguably the most catastrophic maritime disaster in history. The death toll, reaching into the thousands, some estimates soaring as high as 9,000, far surpassed the combined losses of the Titanic and Lusitania. The MV Gustloff marked a significant chapter in the German Labour's Front, Kraft durch Freude Initiative, designed to subsidize leisure activities for German workers. Constructed as the program's inaugural vessel, the ship boasted impressive dimensions at 684 feet in length and a weight exceeding 25,000 tons. Named in homage to a Nazi leader in Switzerland, assassinated by a Jewish medical student, the vessel was launched on May 5, 1937, in the presence of Adolf Hitler, who declared the fallen leader as one of the nation's immortal martyrs. Embarking on its maiden voyage on March 24, 1938, the Gustloff became a symbol of leisure, undertaking approximately 50 cruises over 17 months, catering to around 65,000 vacationers. With the capacity to host about 1,900 individuals, including a crew of 400, the ship, for propaganda purposes, maintained an elegantarian appearance with uniformly sized and apportioned cabins, presenting itself as a ship without social classes. The sole exception was a larger cabin reserved for Hitler, emphasizing its symbolic stature. However, access to the Gustloff was not open to all. The passengers on the Kraft Deutsch Freude flagship were selectively chosen by the party. As the Red Army advanced on East Prussia, Admiral Karl Dönitz initiated Operation Hannibal, a massive evacuation effort transporting German troops and civilians to the west. Commencing on January 21, 1945, an estimated 2 million Germans were evacuated, surpassing the scale of the British evacuation at Dunkirk. The Gustloff tasking with transporting the soldiers of the 2nd Submarine Training Division began taking on additional refugees on January 25th. By the afternoon of January 29th, registration ceased at 7,956 passengers, 
with witnesses suggesting possibly another 2,000 boarded afterward. Shortly after noon on January the 30th, the Wilhelm Gustloff departed the harbour, setting its course for Kiel, Germany. Faced with a challenging decision, the senior officers weighed the risks posed by Allied mines strategically placed in shallow waters to impede military vessels. However, the Gustloff, devoid of weaponry and not designated as a military vessel, risked catastrophic damage if it encountered a mine, necessitating an evacuation. The daunting alternative presented the Gustloff with venturing into the open waters of the Baltic Sea. Careful navigation might allow them to elude Soviet submarines patrolling the deeper waters. Despite the less than ideal January weather with constant snow and wind, making visual navigation difficult. It also provided concealment from enemy periscopes. The officer concluded that the best chance lay in making a run for it in the open sea. Initially intended to be part of a larger convoy, Unforeseen mechanical issues forced two ships to turn back, leaving the Gustlov accompanied solely by the torpedo boat Luve. Concerned about the ship's engines, Captain Friedrich Patterson decided on a cautious speed of no more than 12 knots, rejecting the advice of Wilhelm Zahn, commander of the 2nd Submarine Training Division, who proposed an increased speed to deter potential attacks. Peterson also dismissed the recommendation of First Officer Louis Rize, who suggested hugging the coastline. Ultimately, the Gustlov charted a course through deep waters known to be clear of mines. As the clock approached 6 p.m., a pivotal message reached the captain for warning of an approaching minesweeper convoy. In response, the captain swiftly activated the ship's navigation lights a precautionary measure aimed at averting a potential collision in the darkened waters. The intriguing aspect of this communication lies in its mysterious origin. None of the radio operators aboard the Gustlov or in its accompanying vessel, the Love, claim to have received such a directive. The ambiguity surrounding this message raises questions of whether it was a miscommunication or perhaps a deliberate act of sabotage. Despite the activation of navigation lights, the Gustlov encountered no minesweepers during its course. However, the narrative took an ominous turn around 7 p.m. with a nearby Soviet submarine S-13, commanded by Alexander Marinesco, into the scene. Marinesco, grappling with strained relations with his chain of command due to delayed missions attributed to his terrestrial indulgence in alcohol identified the large, illuminated ship as a conspicuous target. In his pursuit of enhancing his reputation, he unleashed three torpedoes at 9.16 p.m., each bearing messages symbolizing the Soviet's thirst for revenge against the Nazi forces, for the suffering inflicted on the Soviet populace earlier in the war. The impact of these torpedoes was devastating, striking the crew living quarters, the women's naval auxiliary swimming pool area, and ultimately, the engine room and lower decks. The ship, engulfed in chaos, faced its fatal blows with hundreds of lives lost instantaneously. Trapped under debris and bulkheads, many individuals found themselves destined to go down with the ship. Although the Gustlov was equipped with lifeboats and rafts intended for 5,000 people, the harsh reality unfolded as many of these life-saving devices lay frozen to the deck. Compounded by the fact that one of the torpedoes had hit the crew quarters, eliminating those best trained to handle the crisis, the effective use of lifeboats became further impeded. In the face of these challenges, the grim reality emerged. There was no conceivable way to accommodate everyone in the lifeboats. The Gustloff swiftly transformed into a chaotic battleground for survival, a frantic theater where the struggle for life unfolded with imaginable intensity. Even for those managing to escape the clutches of the mortality wounded ship, 
and ventured into the open water. The life rafts provided scant refugee, unable to accommodate the overwhelming number of desperate passengers. One of the survivors, a 10-year-old boy, recalled witnessing a heart-wrenching scene. A tumultuous crush of people, many of them children, in a desperate bid to ascend the stairs and secure a spot on an accessible lifeboat. With the ship tilted toward the port side, rendering the starboard side lifeboats inaccessible, the plight became increasingly dire. Armed with a knife pilfered from his uncle's uniform, he became one of the fortunate few to cut the ropes and find a place on the lifeboat drifting away from the doomed Gustlov. A lot of people jumped. And then they all tried to get on the lifeboat and, of course, they pull you over and they get hit in the head with a paddle. And they get hit on the hands. He said. It was just gruesome. Just awful. Most of them died. For those lingering on the deck, the inevitability of death in the freezing waters loomed even closer. As the Gustloff tilted and descended into the abyss, the soldier, facing the prospect of a slow and agonizing demise, pulled out his pistol and made the unbearable choice to spare his loved ones of the agony. Tragically, he exhausted all of the bullets before turning the gun on himself. The survivor vividly recalled the grim table as a soldier slid down the icy deck in pursuit of his family, disappearing in the enveloping darkness of the sea. As German rescue boats summoned by Gustlov's crew approached to pick up survivors, they faced the same dilemma as those in lifeboats. Who to pick up and when to stop? They too were at risk from the S-13. Torpedo boat commander Robert Herring aboard of the T-36 had to make the decision to leave many more behind when his boat was at full capacity. He then had to take invasive maneuvers to avoid suffering the same fate as the Gaslov. Just over an hour after the S-13 torpedoes hit, the Gaslov sunk into the sea. By the next morning, the waters surrounding the Gaslov were filled with bodies, many of them those of children whose life jackets caused them to float upside down. Of the estimated 10,000 people on board the Gaslov, only 1,239 could be registered as survivors, making this the sinking with the highest death toll in maritime history. Despite the high number of civilian deaths, allegations that sinking the Gustlov constituted a war crime are largely unfounded. Because of the presence of weapons and nearly a thousand military personnel on board, but whatever category those Wilhelm Gustloff victims fit into, U-boat trainees, women's naval auxiliary members, Hitler Youth, reluctant conscripts, German civilians, mothers, and children, they were part of a maritime tragedy that has yet to be rivaled in scale. In little over an hour. Volrath wrote that Gustav had dragged love, hope, and wishes down to the bottom of the sea. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on our upcoming videos.